Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the Restore Festival here at the Forest Space in Borough High Street. It is completely incredible. I would love to live here, as I'm sure all of you would. Um, I am, uh, my name is Gerdip Loyal. I am a food writer and curator of the online platform Mother Tongue, which you should all check out at some point. Uh, but I'm really excited to introduce uh, a great friend of mine today. Uh, she is the author of three books, including A Modern Way to Eat, A Modern Way to Cook, and A Modern Cook's Year, and her brand new book, One, just over here, uh, One Pot Pan Planet. Um, introducing Anna Jones. Ah, oh, thank you. Oh, babe. It's so nice to be here. Yeah, in this gorgeous place. We're all saying that essentially we're going to move in. Um, Indeed, we really yeah. are. Yeah, Ella from Forest said it's fine. We're just going to have like a new house share sort of thing. I'm going to break it to my husband and I'm sure he'll be fine. We're in, yeah, we're it's in. It's going to be in. great. Um, but yeah, just it's so nice to be here with all of you guys and also. Such a pleasure to be here with my incredibly good friend, Gadeep, um, who I have so much love and respect for, and you absolutely must check out all of the brilliant work that he is um, doing. Okay. But we're gonna... We're gonna kick off. Yeah, let's get cooking. Off. Let's make sure that respect remains. So, before we kick off, what are you actually cooking today? So, today I'm doing a recipe from one, um, and it's just a very quick one. We're doing something that we could do on one hob, um, in one pan, and it's just a really kind of quick weeknight dinner situation. It's some seeded squash and pistachio flatbreads. Seeded um, squash. Seeded pistachio. squash and pistachio Delicious. flatbreads. I have on this. page 103. People at home who are watching, everyone, um, yeah. in the book. Yeah, and I seem to have a habit of um, making all of my recipe titles kind of tongue twisters, which I'm going to bear in mind next time I write a book. Because every time I sort of come up with a recipe name, it seems to be quite difficult to get out, including the name of the book, One Pot Pan Planet. <laughs> One Pot Pan Planet. Um, but, yeah. Nailed. So, we, we, can, kick we, off? we kick off with the and cooking. I'll start with okay. a bit of cooking, yeah. Perfect. So, um, I'm just going to make a really quick... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I have got something caught in my throat. Mm. So I'm just going to make a really quick flatbread. And these are... <coughs> no one's going to eat this, don't worry. Um, <coughs> and they are quicker than going to the corner shop, essentially. Um, there's about 100 grams of flour, which you can see... I've very precisely measured. And then um, about half a teaspoon of baking powder and a good pinch of salt. And then I'm going to also add some cumin seeds. You could add any spice you wanted to here. We're going with a kind of, you know, loosely sort of North African flavour vibe here. So, so what other spices do you think would work? In <coughs> Pardon? What other spices do you think could work in these flatbreads? So, any kind of whole spice would be nice. Okay. I quite like that crunch yeah, of nice. something through it. So some coriander seeds bashed up. Nice, very nice. Um, yeah, fennel seeds, classic in a flatbread. Even, you could even mix your spices, guys. Go absolutely wild and do that. Um, and the liquid we're going to use to kind of bind this is some yogurt. So um, again, measuring this very precisely. Um, but I love these flatbreads because um, I really feel like you can make them kind of almost in the time it would take to run to a corner shop. And here in London, a corner shop literally is sort of two or three minutes away. I'm not talking about a corner shop an hour away. So um, they're just really quick. And it always just feels, I don't know, quite much more nourishing to me than, yeah, you know, definitely. one of those flatbreads that you might get out of, you know, a packet. Yeah. So, so what was your inspiration, your inspiration for this recipe in particular? Well, for this recipe, it was really, I, I cook stuff kind of on flatbreads quite a lot. It's quite a thing that we do, kind of lunch and dinner at home. Um, it's, it, I just think it's a really easy way of making, making you know, a meal out of not so much. Yeah. Um, you know, we're big fans of tacos and those kind of things in our house as well. But the inspiration for, for this was really... Just, it was just something I made for dinner one night, and it was one of those things where you're like, wow, this actually really, really, really works. Um, and I think quite often we think that we need, you know, to, to, to roast something or cook something or do, 
you know, mm. something that takes a long time. But actually, as I'm going to, you know, show with this one, um, quite often you can just literally do it all quickly in yeah. one pan. And we can use something like a squash, which we're going to use, but we're going to grate it, which means that it's going to cook really, really quickly. And so you're, you're getting that kind of delicious, charred, squashy flavour, but because it's grated, you know, you're, co you're cooking it in five or ten minutes instead of, you know, the sort of hour it might take you to roast squash. So, um, and, and we're just using a lot of really delicious kind of spice. I'm going to turn this on. I am honestly so scared of these induction hobs. Like, every single demo I ever do, they seem to not work. But this one, so far, looks very reliable. Um, so I'm just going to add a little bit of onion to the pan. We're just doing it for two people here, so um, I'm just going to very finely slice. It's actually... So while it's your slicing, don't mind me yeah. asking. So um, we're talking about um, the whole one pan thing, which is obviously one of the yeah. sort of philosophies around your new book. Can you talk us through a little bit about your new book? So today we're going to talk to you a little bit about food for the soul. Um, and it'd be great to just get your, thought, your whole inspiration behind the new book. Was this a book that you always had in mind? It kind of was, um, but it, as with all books, um, it sort of changed shape as I was writing it. Yeah. Um, I really wanted this to be a book that felt really easy, that felt like it was, um, that felt like it was, you know, easy things that could be cooked really quickly. Yeah. In you know on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night because I actually really believe that it's those meals that we need to get right. It's those needs that we need meals that we need solutions for. I think if we kind of like get those boring, basic kind of weeknight meals together and have mm. some amazing, healthy, um, vibrant options for them, then then that's what shifts our diet. It's not the kind of like you know, big yeah. cooking at the weekends. Yeah. Yeah. It's not necessarily the kind of like day spent batch cooking. It's like having really quick, simple solutions for um, the things that, you know, for, for when we come home from work and, you know. And, and actually, I think as a chef, quite often, um, this is very hot. Um, I think as a chef, quite often, you know, you, you, want, you want to do something fancy. You want to kind of make a really fancy meal, you know, a really fancy recipe that, you know, takes a long time to cook and, you know, has loads of far-fangled ingredients and, you know, requires someone to go on a website and buy this, that and the other because that feels innovative, it yeah. feels new, it feels, um, it feels kind of, you know, interesting. But actually, I think what I've learned over the course of, like, writing my books and, you know, cooking quite a lot of recipes for people is that it's those recipes aren't the recipes the recipes that are relevant and the recipes that are helpful to people and the recipes that kind of change how people view food and, and cook and eat um just keep turning this down it's a very it's a very hot hob um uh, I, I i think it's 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 actually those simple recipes. Yeah. Like, my most popular recipes are the simplest ones. Yeah. It's the, like, one-pot pasta where everything yeah. goes in one pot and you don't have to do any washing up. Or it's, you know, the, the, the really, really easy dal that, you know, um, it's, it takes 25 minutes to, 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 to make. So it, that was quite a shift, actually. In, in I was going to say, have you always cooked like that in that one pot? Or is that kind of a recent lockdown thing? Because did you write much of this book through lockdown? I wrote most of this book kind of... Um, before lockdown, actually, and then I kind of rewrote it, so that was fun. Um, no, I um, no, it was fun. It was. I, I think I wrote most of it before lockdown. Um, I think a lot of it is inspired by you know my life now. I've got a young son, and you know, time in the kitchen is definitely not the kind of long, languid hours that it used to be. I used to have no sympathy for people who like wouldn't make a bechamel or something like that. I was like, come on, how difficult is a bechamel? And now I'm when did you like, last make a bechamel? Yeah, about seven years <laughs> right, ago. Okay. Yeah, before my son was born. Um, also, bechamels feel a bit retro, don't they? But I still love That's them. I love them. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think it sort of started, you know, from that kind of general sort of life inspiration of the way I cook. Um, but definitely over the last couple of years. I think I sat down and added up how many meals we, not just me, but collectively, one will have cooked if they were 
um, cooking breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, and I think I got to about two and a half thousand, then I stopped, because I was like, come on, this is too much. Um, so we've all cooked much more, and I think that, you know, we've honed our skills, I think we've become more connected with food, yeah. and with, you know, Absolutely. and with wh where our food's coming from, hopefully, and, 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 and been in the kitchen a bit more, but I think... I think it's become a bigger part of our day as well, hasn't it? Because yeah. Because as we were all stuck at home, just not wanting to be on another Zoom call. It was like yeah. a big relief, wasn't it? It was like really exciting of what are we going to make? And it really exactly. became the whole thing, didn't it? Yeah, I think it really, really did. And I think for, um, but I do think, you know, the same as a, a lot of people are saying to me that they've kind of almost got cooking fatigue now. Yeah. That they're kind of out the other end and they really enjoyed that cooking, but you know, they haven't ready got- to eat out. Well, they still want <laughs> to cook at home. They yeah. still want to eat the, you know, healthy food, but now they're sort of, life has amped back up again and they don't have perhaps as much time yeah. as before and so hopefully this you know a lot of the recipes in the book kind of answer that okay um so let's so just just touch on the book a bit a little bit more so so the title is one pot one pan one planet yeah what what, what what's the sort of the, the overriding kind of um theme around it obviously there's a big theme around planetary eating sustainable eating what do you think are how would you describe sort of the message of the book in a nutshell and what do you think the main things are, the, the three big things maybe that people can do to be well, sustainably? Well, that's a great question. You know. um, uh, so I think that the book in general, you know, is, is called One Pot Pan Planet because, you know, I wanted to bring together the kind of ethos I have around food and cooking. I wanted to kind of bring some of the people who, who are already invested in this kind of, you know, vegetable-led way of eating, you know, perhaps on the next step of the journey, I hate the word journey, but I just used it, so there we go. Um, uh, on the next step of the, what's another word? Voyage. Vo voyage is nicer, isn't it? Voyage is, uh, yeah, no. a voyage journey. No. Um, um, and so I wanted to sort of arm people who are already, you know, convinced by this kind of, you know, vegetable-led eating, whether that's every meal or whether that's just a few days a week. Um, uh, with, with a bit more kind of information on how they can eat in a more sustainable way. Um, and so the book is about that. Both the recipes, I hope, are, you know, I, I know are super sustainable. Um, but also it kind of includes a bit more information about how we can perhaps take a few more steps as humans, as individuals, as kind of communities. Um, and I, I, I thought it was useful to have, you know, that information there because for me, that's, you know, my cookbooks are the place I go before I go to the shops. My cookbooks are the place I go before I, you know, decide what we're going to eat as a family for the week. Um, and, you know, I am interested in this stuff, so I'm going to go to the library, get out sustainability books, read the websites, read the articles, that kind of thing. But I think for a lot of people, you know, the conversation is quite confusing yeah. and it can be quite overwhelming and I think there's as, as you well know there's quite a lot of counter information it's like well you know don't eat imported food but buy bananas because they're sustainable because they come mm. on a boat so it's very difficult I think for people to assimilate all of yeah. those rules yeah. but actually when I started looking into it you know a lot of the a lot of the overriding themes I mean there are those there are those kind of misnomers, but there, a lot of the overriding themes were simple. They were communicable. They were um, important, I, I think, to be shared. So, so that's what I've done in between what I hope are kind of like delicious, easy recipes. There's also, you know, tips and, and ways that we can be a bit more sustainable. And one of those is around kind of cooking in one pan or one vessel. So, I mean, it's definitely not I've, so I'm just going to run you quickly through. I was going to say, yeah, just for people that are cooking along at home. What yeah, so we've, we've had half an onion in here. Just brown that off a little bit. Um, and then about a little bit of squash. I'm not doing this too exactly. And what squash did you use for this? I just used butternut because okay. yeah. that's what we had. Um, but you could use any type yeah. of squash. Okay. Any uh, and so of, that, was, that was ras al for people that don't know. That, what that was ras al hanout. So ras al hanout is a really, really amazing kind of North African spice blend um it varies kind of as much maybe not quite as much you'll know better on this than me as um garam masala so different places and different yeah. people who make it will make it in a different way but generally <coughs> excuse me it's got a lot of ginger it's got a lot of turmeric it's got quite a lot of cinnamon it's got rose in it um and i think it's one of those really amazing kind of 
spice. Mm, it smells incredible already. It does smell incredible, doesn't it? You've got that kind of, the fragrant rose, I think, really yeah, is what makes absolutely. a difference here because there's all those quite, quite deep, kind of heady, kind of, not heady is the wrong word, deep, kind of yeah. earthy notes. But then you've got this rose that kind of like brings this brightness, this freshness, this kind of, this this heady yeah. character. So, and if people didn't um, have Rasal honey at home, what could they use? Oh, they could use a pinch of cinnamon, a pinch, yeah, okay. pinch of turmeric, a pinch of chili, something like that. But I think these spice blends are brilliant, especially if you're cooking in a smaller kitchen or you know without you know yeah. loads of shelves for your spices because they, you know, they do so much work for you, exactly. don't they? And they do so much kind of work for you on the flavour side of things. So anyway, um, this is in here, and this is kind of going to be loosely our sort of topping for. For our snap bread. Um, I'm just going to cook that down a bit more. But what I was going to say before that was one of the things I discovered about when I was doing the research for this that was like one of the kind of like unsexiest topics in the world was that actually the energy, you know, we, we really think about the sustainability of our ingredients, whether they're flown in, where they're from, if they've come on a boat. Um, one of the things I think we hadn't considered or I hadn't considered was the energy we use when we cook. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like... It's a real end-to-end -end thing, isn't it? From what you shot yeah. all the way through to actually doing the washing up and yeah. actually thinking about the whole process. Thinking about the whole process. Yeah. And that wasn't a bit of a process I necessarily wanted to think about because it felt so, like, unsexy. Mm. Like, there's a whole section in here about, like, you know, fridge and freezer efficiency. And I really, like, did not see that in my life, that I was going to be writing a, you know, you know, a whole page on fridge and freezer efficiency. But, you know... I think if we're committed to this thing, we've got yeah, to be no, committed absolutely. to the whole thing. And I think so many chefs will, and cooks, you know, will turn on an oven, two hobs, a grill, a food processor, you know, and, and you'll have this, not only will you have like a crazy amount of washing up, which is really annoying, um, you'll also be using like loads and loads and loads of kind of unnecessary power. Um, and so actually this whole cooking in one pot thing it's simple from a kind of, I think it's a simple concept. I think it doesn't, these recipes don't scare people because it's like, right, I can get all of that yeah, in there and I can get all of that out there and it's going to be okay. But also there's, there's, there's these brilliant kickbacks in terms of energy, but also in terms of, as you say, the washing up yeah, at the end, you're washing yeah. one pan, you're using less water, you're using less resources there. So, um, yeah, definitely not, um, yeah. Definitely not something I thought I would be writing about, <laughs> but it's all, it's all so useful, actually. No, and I absolutely. think it's all this kind of forgotten knowledge that, you know, I know my parents' generations yeah. had that we've kind of, you know, slightly lost. So um, from, from fridge efficiency on to a couple of the other big themes then of the book. Fridge so, efficiency. So fridge is a sexy topic. On. We're going to on something a bit sexy. Um, um, so what, I guess there's two other, I guess those quite big themes. One is one that people have read about a lot, which is around yeah. eating more plants. And then, then there's a whole load of stuff. I mean, it's an incredible book. If you haven't... Um, if you haven't seen it or bought it, um, it really is worth it. I mean, there are hundreds. How many recipes? It I has to go about, into the hundreds. There's 200 and <laughs> 200 something, yeah. And, but it's just filled with, with loads of tips, loads of bits of advice, loads of sort of, I guess, just snippets of things that you can do, which are just sort of small nudges towards being a little bit more sustainable every day. So, there's, as I said, there's, there's a couple of big themes. One is around eating more plants and putting them at the centre of your plate. And then the other one is around thinking about waste differently. So, should we, let's, let's talk a bit about both of those. So... Yeah, so, well, they're the two big things, basically. They're the kind of two headlines. And I think we all, we all know this, um, that putting plants at the centre of your diet is well regarded as the most impactful thing we can do as individuals. I mean, we're not going to get on to kind of like government level stuff here. That's a whole other conversation I don't want to get into and that I'm not... Um, you know, necessarily an expert on, but you know, I, I think if we can take ownership of what we do as individuals, that's yeah. really powerful. And, so, and have you always been vegetarian? I've been vegetarian for about 12 years. So not always, no, not always. I grew up I in a very- I didn't actually think I knew you were vegetarian even until your second book came out. Really? I think it was reading <laughs> your first book and it was just a surprise. It was like, oh yeah, where's the meat? There's well, no meat. It's really, it's really incredible what you've done in terms of making, for me, people who are you know, hardcore carnivores yeah. even, to kind of feel like, well, I kind of did that on purpose. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Because, um, apologies for my uh, slightly awkward chopping, by the way. I'm, I'm sort of, I shouldn't have worn heels because I'm really, really bending down now, I feel like. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I, 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 that was kind of intentional because I feel like, you know, there has definitely been some sort of fairly uh, wholesome and perhaps quite 
negative connotations around mm. sort of vegetarianism over the years. Um, and I sort of knew that the food I was eating, the food I was making, was this really actually engaging, vibrant, creative food. And the kind of word vegetarian didn't really seem to match up with that. Um, I think for a lot of people, not necessarily for me, but for a lot of people, it kind of conjured up the kind of, you know, brightly painted cafes and yeah. kind of, you know, very mung bean central, which I'm, I'm there for the mung bean. I love a mung <laughs> bean. But, you know, I think... It, 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 uh, that was intentional. I wanted people, and, and I still, you know, with this book and with all the stuff I do, I want, I want people to be led yeah. by the joy of food, by the connectivity and the kind of, um, you know, a, 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 and the importance of eating and sharing. And, 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 you know, I want to shout from the rooftops about how wonderful and brilliant and fabulous, you know, food and vegetables are. Um, so, no, it was, it was intentional. And I think there are friends of mine who literally still don't think I'm vegetarian. I'm like, come on, guys, this is kind of... <laughs> so what, so if there are, I guess, people in the audience, people at home, um, who want to, I guess, start putting vegetables a bit more at the centre of what they're yeah. doing in terms of cooking, what are, your, what are your sort of big bits of advice in terms of how they should approach that sort of shift in mindset and their shift in, that, in the kitchen? Well, that's a good question, again. You've done this before, haven't you? I think it's... Um, I'm just adding a bit of pomegranate molasses here, by the way. Um, and I'm doing that because we've kind of got the sweetness of the onion, we've got the sweetness of the squash, we've got that kind of earthy headiness from here. But what we're missing a bit here is some acidity, and the pomegranate is, molasses is going to bring some sweetness, um, but also a very welcome bit of acidity. And, if you and again, what if people can't get hold of pomegranate molasses at home? Oh, I think a really good cheat is actually... Um, you know, a bit of like, if you have some like sticky balsamic vinegar. Delicious, okay. And, and a bit of lemon and nice. maybe a bit of honey, yeah. something like that. It's just okay. about, it's just about yeah. echoing that kind of really, um, those, those flavors. So I'm just gonna leave this here and I'm gonna reuse this pan to toast our flatbread. Um, so we were talking about how people can, what your advice is in terms of people putting vegetables a bit more at the center of what they're doing in the kitchen. Yeah, so I think, there's millions of things that can be done. But I think the big thing is, is just to do it and not to think about it as like a major life change. Yeah, OK. I think quite often, you know, you, you know I, and I'm guilty of that in other areas of my life. I'm like, right, I've got to do this and I've got to be yeah. perfect and it's got to be the whole thing. I'm like doing yeah. all or nothing. Um, but I really think that it's, it's actually... You know, this whole thing is a meal by meal thing. It's like, you know, waking up every day and, you know, wondering what decisions you can make that day, either, you know, f f for your own health, for your own well being, mm. you know, perhaps to, to make a few decisions that might feel, you know, like you're, you know, lightening your load a little bit. That are good um, for the soul. Exactly, that are good for the soul. Mm. I like it. Nice link. Um, so, yeah, I think um, it's, it's definitely. I think it's definitely about sort of a step-by-step a, a -step thing. And I think it's also about coming from where you are yeah. as well. Because I think quite, you know, often we can, you know, think, right, okay. And, and I think it's especially um, relevant in kind of, you know, this sort of sustainability field. And even kind of in sort of the vegan, vegetarian um, cooking, you can think that, oh, I've got to have all these like far-fangled ingredients. Mm. Or I've got to have like an electric car and I've got to be perfect and it's got to kind of got to all it's got to all happen together but it really doesn't and I think that's the brilliant thing about this food part of sustainability and of putting vegetables at the yeah. center of your diet it is actually really quite accessible there are some things in the sustainability yeah. conversation that aren't accessible like buying an electric car or you know perhaps choosing never to fly if your job involves flying or getting the train everywhere, which actually is, you know, a brilliant idea, but quite prohibitively expensive. Um, you know, a lot of these decisions, and I know some of the recipes in this book do have, you know, more expensive ingredients and, and things that aren't crazily affordable, but most of the recipes are pretty affordable. And actually, a lot of the techniques, like this, you know, using one pan and saving yeah. energy, that is applicable to every household yeah, in this country. And so I think it's this, you know, piece of the conversation that is really useful um, <coughs> I think as well in terms of, you know, putting vegetables at the centre of your diet, um, 
I think the, the, the key thing there for me feels like you know having you know having the stuff there. Yeah. I okay. Feel like it's not about you know I know most cookbooks or a lot of cookbooks start with this gigantic list of kind of spices and ingredients and things that you need to go and buy and I don't agree with that at all I think you know if there's a couple of things that you love if you go to a restaurant and you know that you really really love you know the Carolyn curry from here or you really really love the um you know the the kind of um I, I don't know the the stuffed peppers from here or the, the the stuffed vine leaves or whatever from your local Greek restaurant it's pinpointing a couple of those things that you know you love that you know your you know household or family might eat and then and then building up kind of your collection of stuff yeah. but i think it's it's having you know and, and and then i think it's building up like a small repertoire yeah totally um it's not about having to have hundreds and hundreds yeah. of recipes yeah. i mean there are hundreds there, there are a lot of recipes out there but it's about building yeah. the ones that work well i, I think, think one of the things that you do in terms of that i suppose which just thinks so that's sort of you know just adapting what you do every day is um, one of the things that you do in the book is you talk a lot about um, everyday vegetables and the things that people would just use every day and you yeah. give people really I suppose some quite unique and interesting ways of thinking about certain vegetables in different ways what have been I suppose ones that have really resonated with people in terms of getting people to think about everyday vegetables in different ways well I think yeah I think we all have like our cooking autopilot yeah. don't we we all have yeah. our thing that we do with each thing what I mean let's just ask about what are the veg that people have most if, when you get something in the, from the shops and you get it home and you go what do I do with this mine is cauliflower I get them home and I'm like what am I doing with this what are, what are the ones that people have I think celeriac, celeriac is quite often a big one Swede Swede Swede, yeah. Swede. you know Swede is actually one of my favorites okay ever um, but Any I think others that people have difficulty with turn it. Okay. I think those are two that are really, I think that someone's, I, I, I think we've got to have like a Sweden turn at revolution because yeah. I feel like quite a lot of the other kind of like, you know, veg that was hanging out in the background has had its time in the sun, hasn't it? Like, Kale's had its moment now. Kale's had its <laughs> moment. Ottolenghi really did it for the cauliflower. Um, you know, there's, there's yeah, been yeah. these, these very kind of, um, you know, very British, yeah. very kind of, yeah. um, and by British I mean kind of local to this country rather than n necessarily totally British flavours. But, you know, I, I, I think the Swede and the turnip kind of need their time because actually, yeah. um, you know, one of the joys of writing um, my column for The Guardian for so long was, was that, you know, you'd get an editor being like, right, I want you to do turnips this week and you'd literally be like, Hot turnips and so you know you'd be set this really lovely challenge of kind of turning turnips to something that I guess people maybe only ever boil and mash into something that you know is worthy yeah. of the center of your plate and exactly the same um exactly yeah. the same with swede um I do a recipe that I love which is kind of um it's like wedges of swede with a, a butter that has smoked chili dried chili, yeah. um, it has sage, it has rosemary, it has a bit of maple syrup but mixed with either butter or olive oil if you're vegan um, and then roast it off and it becomes this kind of slightly transcendent thing no one can really believe that it's sweet. Yeah. Um, That's delicious. Yeah. It's, so, just, so just for people that are following at home, how thick yeah. did you roll those? So I cut this in two, our little, okay. so it was 100 grams of flour, 100 grams of yogurt, half teaspoon of baking yeah. powder, pinch of salt, pinch of cumin. Um, and really it's about 50 grams per flatbread. So you can multiply that or reduce it as you like. Um, and I just rolled it out really to, to about sort of, I mean, pound coin thickness. Let's go with that. Um, about pound coin thickness. You can either do that with your hands, stretching it as you would a pizza dough, or you can use a rolling pin, which is a bit easier. And would this, what could people do if they were gluten free? What, would there be other flowers that work for this recipe? Um, yeah, you could. I have made this with gluten-free flour okay. and it definitely yep. works. I think because of the yogurt. Also, if you're vegan, you could use a coconut yogurt or yeah, okay. another kind of yogurt, which actually I do a lot at home. Um, uh, yeah, so you, you could use a gluten-free flour. What is good about this flatbread recipe is that... Um, is that th th there's a lot of moisture that comes from the yogurt um, and that really helps sort of counteract the sort of dryness that can sometimes come from like a gluten-free flour. Um, 
But equally, you know, there's other incredible gluten-free things. I think chickpea flour is like, you know, yeah. I would choose that above gluten-free flour any day of the week. And actually making a really, really simple, almost part for yeah. part um, chickpea or gram yeah. flour yeah. batter like with, exactly, yeah. with water. And then frying it like a pancake Lovely. would kind of always be my choice yeah. for a gluten-free. Because it's just got yeah. more flavor, hasn't it? I mean, the gluten-free blends are yeah. super useful. Um, so, so, okay, let's talk about cooking for a little bit. I suppose we're talking a little bit about food for the soul. Do you find that, that cooking is good for your soul? What, like, what, what, what is, like, is cooking your like, special place that you go to? What, what is it about cooking in particular? I mean... Find is good for the soul. I, I think cooking is good for the soul because I really think, you know, cooking is like the great connector, isn't it? It's the one thing... The eating and cooking, it's the one thing that all of us are going to do three times a day. You know, I, there, there are, I can count on one hand, actually, there's only two people I've ever met who I felt like didn't want to talk about food. You know, they, they were sadly an ex-boyfriend who treated food as fuel. Didn't work out, but he's a lovely man. Um, and um, I think that is, um, you know, it, to me, it feels like, it feels like such a wonderful way... Yeah to connect and that doesn't mean it has to be like a great big fantastic mm. dinner it can be like you know some pancakes or just you know yeah. a cup of coffee and a you know yeah. slice of toast it's it's just a way for me i think of connecting and of sharing joy and yeah. of and, and and showing care and showing but well, it's interesting connection. that you say a piece of toast. I feel like you know even just cooking a piece of toast you're actually connecting with yourself in that moment just yeah really enjoying the, the moment of waiting yeah. for this to come out. Yeah, and I think, yeah. I think it is like an opportunity to us. I'm not going to lie and say this happens to me every time I cook. I think much more before I had a little five-year-old boy running around, um, I was much more in a meditative, meditative space when I was cooking because the cooking really is, it's like, it's my creative space. It's where my brain sort of fires and it's where I can tell all the, all the things are crossing over and all the synapses are working and that and that everything's happening. Um, but definitely when I cook at home now, it's not, you know, it's not like I go into a kind of meditative zen say. It's, you know... Not with Dylan running around. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's for, for me, you know, as it is with, you know, lots of people and families and whether you've got a family or not, whether you're just coming home from work and throwing your food together, it's not always a meditative experience. But what I do always appreciate about food and always find joy in going to turn this off now see how quick that was I mean this I was going kind of easy on it because I didn't want to burn it in front of you guys because that would be really embarrassing um but um you know it it, it really we we kind of rested that while I was talking but had we just made that popped it in the pan we could have had that made in you know four or five minutes yeah. so yeah super quick if you kind of run out of bread but I think um for me that kind of you know it's those moments you know, if you just look around this table, you know, the, the kind of the colours, the kind of smells, mm. those kind of invitations to kind of be present without yeah. sounding like too much of an idiot. Um, I'm not someone who can kind of, you know, necessarily sit down and meditate. I'm not someone who finds it very easy to kind of be completely present in yeah. the moments of everything I'm doing. But there is something about cooking that yeah. really invites me into yeah. that because... You can't ignore your senses. You can't ignore how that smells. You can't ignore like yeah. these pomegranates sitting next to these pistachios mm. and actually how completely amazing that looks. Um, and so I do find that like really, really kind yeah. of super kind of connecting and inspiring. And it does, you know. But it links to one of your other themes, which is I guess a big theme of your last book, which is I suppose being present in the moment, which was all around eating the season in yeah. the moment. So can we talk a little about? Seasonality, like, what are your, what, what, why is it something that you're so passionate about? Well, I think it's something that all chefs, hopefully, are reasonably passionate about these days. Um, They've puffed up incredibly, by the way. I don't yeah. Know if we'll see. Yeah, it's puffed up. Yeah, it's puffed up really well. And I think that we're all quite. I think people feel quite scared of making anything that is called bread or flour. And this, you know, if you feel like you're someone that can't make a bread, this is a really, really good place to start because it's almost foolproof. Um, but I think, you know, ever since I've been a young chef, I think cooking with the seasons has been something that's been just part of how mm. cooking and food is done. And I think I was lucky to be taught by people who really, um, you know, hammered that home yeah. and really taught me to appreciate kind of, you know, the ebb and flow of the year and also, you know, to not throw things away and not waste stuff. 
Um, but I think it's become more and more important, obviously, as we talk, you know, the, you know, the relevance of kind of sustainability around all of this. Um, you know, if we eat kind of local seasonal food, it's a complete shift in terms of our footprint. Um, but also, to me, you know, just connecting with that kind of joy conversation yeah, again, absolutely. it's like, it really punctuates the year for me. You know, as, you know, I, I'm, I, I love those moments. Yeah. I love the kind of asparagus moment when it's all coming out. And What's the season you look forward to um, most? You know what? Anna Jones was a season. If what I season was a would season, you be? I'd be all seasons, babe. I'd be every <laughs> single one. No, I think I would be. I think it would be spring. Yeah. Okay. My birthdays nice. in spring. Nice. I feel like when those green yeah. shoots coming up, yeah. I feel like you know the, those first mm. green vegetables that feel very exciting yeah. after a very long winter of kind yeah. of root vegetables and Swedes, as much as we love them, guys. Um, by kind of you know April, yeah. we're really really ready yeah, for yeah. something fresh. So. Um, you know, it's those moments that I feel, to me, feel, and they feel very joyful, and they feel like, you know, you know, we have our kind of marks of the year, don't we? We have our Christmas, we have our Easter, but having those things that happen every year, whether it's, you know, picking some elderflowers and making some cordial, if I get around to it, I don't every year, but, you know, when I do, that feels like, it, it feels really lovely that those things are happening, and it connects me with nature and I think it's particularly important in kind of an urban environment where we can feel so you know when we where we can feel so yeah, disconnected no, so, um, so just linking on right. from that so sorry what are we what are we doing now oh, we're, we're gonna we're just gonna pop this on the plate babe we're and that's just yogurt that's just plain yogurt that's just a bit of yogurt um just because I want a kind of you know a base I'm not going to use the m word here but you know uh, the moist word, um, but it's going to add a bit of moisture. Then we're going to go on with this, which is our, you know, delicious. Looks incredibly delicious. And actually, I haven't and tried so this. So I should try this. This is not. Hmm, it's good. Um, uh, I just wanted to check the seasoning. <laughs> I'm always saying to everyone, what the problem with you know most cooks is that they don't taste enough. They don't taste enough, and then here I was not tasting anything and being a really bad example of my own advice. But I do think that is a really key thing, don't you, Gerd? Is like uh, taste the whole way through, always. Taste, taste, yeah. taste, taste all the way through, and every element as well. I think my yeah. mom, like she'll sort of like cook the whole thing and then taste at the end and be like, it's oh, terrible. And I'm literally like, well, you know, if yeah. if you tasted it yeah. all the way through, yeah. you would have had. I, think I the know, other thing 20 is season, different yeah. opportunities to add yeah. seasoning, to change, yeah. you know, to change the direction of what you're cooking. But if you just taste it yeah. at the end, then you kind of, you've done all the work. And I think and that really changed my cooking, actually, is seasoning as you go. Yeah. Espe I mean, especially something as simple as just pasta and pesto. If yeah. you have really salty pasta water to start with, it's going to be a different dish. It's just going to be yeah. completely yeah. delicious. And then glug it with olive oil at the end. That's the yeah. same as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's... You know, it's tasting and it's seasoning every element as well. I think that's one thing that we don't think about. I always add a bit of salt with the onions at the beginning because, you know, it starts off yeah. the seasoning story, but it also helps drive off the moisture Absolutely. so the onions yeah. cook quicker. And so I think it's, yeah. Anyway, we've covered taste. We've covered taste. So, so we've a got bit a bit of, of feta going on right. here. And then... And will other, will other, um, other cheeses work on this? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I think other cheeses would work. No cheese would definitely also work. Um, I think one of the things that I really appreciate in dairy and other kind of non-dairy alternatives for dairy, that's a very long and far-fangled way of saying that, but um, is the acidity. I think quite often people will add yogurt or feta or vegan feta because... They think they want like a cheese element. Yeah, yeah. But actually, I think we're forgetting that it brings this very brilliant, very clean um, acidity to a dish that is completely different to the acidity that you might get from pomegranate molasses or vinegar or lemon. Um, it's kind of like a, you know, it. it, it and, and, and I think that quite often yeah. is why I use feta or yogurt yeah. in my cooking. It is for that cleanness, that acidity. Yeah, yeah really nice. Um, so we've got some feta on there. I've chopped up some pistachios, which are going to go on here. And it's really like an assembly, this. It sort of feels slightly embarrassing calling it a recipe <laughs> because, you know, there's not actually that much cooking. And then the final thing we're going to do is come over here, which is this miraculous herb situation from 
square mile farm. So these are going in all Quite over incredible. London. Quite like one um, of those in my house. I'd really love one in my house because, you know, Herbs just really seem to die quite quickly, don't they? And so what you're, um, you're picking coriander there from the bottom? I'm picking some coriander, yeah. But you can have parsley, you okay. can have... Yeah. Um, you can even go with a bit of dill on here. Um, it actually smells super, super So just fresh. picking those fresh... So before we just go into some questions in a minute, one of the other big themes, I guess, just sort of, this is reminding me of it, um, around the book is around um, thinking about waste differently. What are, your, what are your sort of big messages around how people can think about waste differently in the kitchen? Well, I think there's lots to do and think about. I think one of the things that I, that was a big thing for me was when I started, um, I always thought that the perceived wisdom on like wasting less was like doing a weekly shop and going or a bi-weekly shop because it was like, I don't know what everyone's like, what my mum did and what, you know, organised people are supposed to do. Um, and I realised that actually that's not how I cook at all. I'm much more of a kind of instinctive cook. I kind of like come home or, you know, think, start thinking about it at lunchtime. I really, I, I find that quite restricting actually to have my meals planned out for the week. I just don't like it. And I think a lot of people also cook like that. So I think actually... You know just really like diving and, and in the book I kind of lay out like a few different sort of profiles of how I think people cook whether you're a daily cook whether you're a weekly planner whether you're a, a batch cooker and I think looking at yourself and your kind of the way you cook and then kind of like you know working back from that to how you shop I think is really important because for me if I do a weekly shop I'm more likely to kind of waste stuff yeah um so I think it's, it's about buying. It's about making sure that you don't buy too much. It's about making sure that we don't fall for like the two for ones, which luckily a lot of the supermarkets have actually stopped doing now on fresh produce, um, which is a good thing. Um, but it's also about kind of, you know, I think this, this connection with joy, this connection with seasonality, all of the stuff we're talking about, this value that we put on food. And I think really that's the fundamental part of this. We can talk about the kind of, you know, buying and the, 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 the tips to using the end of your carrots and the making veg stock with mm. all of your peelings, which I'm actually, you know, absolutely here for and on board with. But I really think this bit about value around food and value around not just, you know, this block of feta or where it came from, but actually humanising the whole process of food. Yeah. So thinking back to the person who reared the cow that made that feta, thinking that that's a farmer, that's first of all, that's an animal... Secondly, that's a human who reared that animal. Thirdly, there was a person who came and kind of milked that animal. Then there was a guy who drove that milk to the place where the feta, you know, yeah. was made. Then there was this whole long, you know, chain of humans and people who are involved in this food. And I think when we kind of, you know, sort of humanise food and humanise ingredients in that way, they, to me, anyway they take on a completely different value and a completely different kind of importance. And I think that's why, you know, having a connection with where you buy your food or where you farm, you, I mean, sorry, with where you buy your food or even having a connection with the farm that you buy your yeah. food from is so critical because, you know, if you have that connection, if you know the face of the man that grew your carrot, you're less likely to throw that carrot in the bin because it's like it's his face. Doug's carrot. <laughs> I don't know where Doug came from in my head, but thank you, Doug. Um, it's Doug's carrot, yeah, or it's absolutely. you know, it's it's you know, it's Susan's spinach, or whatever yeah. it is. And I think it's fostering that kind of the connection, connection yeah. with our food, and remembering that all of yeah. these things. And I think the last yeah. year, when we couldn't get flour and we couldn't get all of those crazy old things, you know, reminded us that this is a fragile and multifaceted chain of people, yeah. of humans, of processes. And, you know, we are really lucky to be on the receiving end of it and be uh, and have just this amazing amount of food and produce and everything available to us. Amazing. So we've got about 10 minutes to go. As you're finishing off the last bit yeah. of that, we've got time for some questions. Um, if some, you're... Uh, I'll just show this to all of you guys. I'm really sorry I'm not going to give it to you. Um, but it looks delicious, doesn't it? It does look delicious. <laughs> it looks um, very good. No, but it's, um, yeah. So it's a quick a reminder, really that's on page 103, home, yeah. and it was the... It was the seeded squash flatbreads with pistachio and pomegranate. Delicious. Yeah. So we've got time for some questions. If you've got questions at home <coughs> as well on the Zoom, 
I, yeah. I think through the wonders of the internet should be able to see them on here, so please send them through. But do we have any questions in the audience? Mm. Yes, at the back. Um, <clears throat> firstly, uh, thank you for making vegetarian food exciting. I think saving us from the days where it was literally just a mushroom stroganoff, and that was it oh, yeah. <laughs> on the menu. But I was wondering what made you um, switch to being vegetarian? Um, that's a good question. I think it's... Um, I actually was working um, for Jamie Oliver at the time. I was working, helping him kind of develop recipes and, um, yeah, and, and, and work on his book and all oh, the multi-million things that he does. He's an amazing human being. Um, and I felt a bit jaded with food. I kind of, food was always the thing that kind of like, you know, that I felt really excited and sparky about and interested in. And I think I'd been cooking for quite a long time. I just felt a bit like... You know, as you can in a job sometimes, I just felt a bit like, oh, God, I've kind of like, you know, I just didn't feel excited about it. So I made a decision for a few weeks to kind of, um, you know, just shift my diet um, and just not eat meat or fish and see how it felt. And, yeah, that was about 12 years ago. I just haven't really ever wanted to eat meat or fish again. It kind of opened up a really different um, way of cooking to me. And I felt much better, you know, in my body, in my kind of life in the creative way I was cooking and eating um, and I think every moment from then has just um, sort of cemented for me that it's definitely the right decision for me and for my life and obviously the the kind of ethical considerations that you know have become a big part of a, a big part of it too for me so so yeah that was I guess that was kind of the process and as I say I think that the way it shifted my cooking the way it kind of I think, I think quite often in creative things, we can have the building blocks that we're kind of like born with or we're taught. And for me, that was kind of like, have your meat, have your fish, have your stuff to go with it, you know? And, and that, without realizing, that was like how I was thinking about putting plates mm. of food together. And when I took all of that away and I had like, you know, just like, I, I had in some senses more restrictions because I was only eating, there were certain things I, I wasn't eating. It actually opened up how I was thinking about food in a completely different way. And I always think about, you know, there's, there's, there's musicians, I guess, who've written whole kind of like, you know, whole works on like one yeah. octave. And I always find that like so fascinating that, you know, actually by limiting yourself, yeah. your creativity becomes so much more vivid and alive. And that's definitely, yeah, it was definitely my Amazing. experience. <coughs> Great question. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, we're at the front here. Um, I'm really into cooking myself and I would absolutely love to kind of work on my own cookbook or something in the future. But when you were writing perhaps your first book, I know you were already quite established within the industry. But like, how did you sort of try and refine your style, I guess, to make sure it was all consistent for like the purpose of a book? Yeah, well, I think I, as you say, I, I had been working like in food for quite a few years um, before... I started writing any of my own stuff. Um, but it felt like quite a different time as well. Like, I started writing my first book about 10 years ago, and, you know, the food scene felt like a very different scene then. I mean, no one knew what a food stylist was. No one kind of, like, you know, Instagram wasn't even a thing, if we can imagine a world um, that exists like that. So it was very different, and there wasn't this kind of, like, open access to kind of, you know... Um, uh, like people's different styles and people's different ways of communicating food, like all the food media came through cookbooks or through the kind of essentially the broadsheet press. And then there were a few online outlets like doing some good stuff like Food 52 back then, but there wasn't very much. So actually, I think now in a way, it's quite an amazing time because whilst it is, I think, increasingly difficult to kind of find uh, something that hasn't been said there's also an amazing amount of access to um to everything to you know different cookbooks different yeah. styles different ways of kind of presenting yourself different cuisines and and i i often feel slightly um you know slightly nervous that you know when i'm coming up with ideas for a new cookbook i'm like oh my god is it in there is there stuff in there and 
I actually think that, you know, th there can be so much pressure put on people to find a niche or find a USP or find a thing. But actually, really, the best food writers in my mind and, and, the, and the people whose food I enjoy the most, it's just... You know, they don't necessarily have a niche. It's just mm -hmm. coming from their heart and coming yeah. from what they believe, what they cook, what 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 is them. And so, I think my best advice would just be to kind of like, you know, do, 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 for it just just to come from you. I think you know there are uh, if you're doing what feels right and feels good and feels like you, then it's never going to be compromised. Um, and also, the other thing to say is I really just think that people in food are the absolute best people. They're just the best people. Like, I've been shown so much generosity by other people in the food industry, you know, chefs, writers, um, bloggers, e everyone, top to bottom. And, you know, there, there is an energy to that. You know, food is, you know, is connecting. You are the first one in, you are the last one out because you're going in with the ingredients, you're clearing up at the end. But... I'm only saying that because, I mean, if there are people that you respect and like in food, then contact them, ask them. And, you know, I've done a lot of that in my career, and I've always been so pleasantly surprised by how generous and welcoming people are. There's a lot to be said for sliding into people's DMs. Oh, yeah. Every now and then yeah, people yeah, reply. Yeah, they really do. do it. Thank That's you. That's a great question. Um, there are a couple of questions just on the chat at home. Um, people asked, were you cooking flatbreads in oil? No, that was a good point, actually. It's a totally dry pan. Totally dry pan, so okay. If you're thinking like, yeah. well, you're, it's not, but the same, you know, dry heat as like a tandoor oven or something. It would be wonderful if we had a tandoor oven here, but it's that right. same principle. It's just a very hot, dry heat. Uh, there was a question on uh, where's the recipe available, and it's on page 103 of the book. Um, and then there was someone said, did you really put yogurt in the dough? Yes, yeah. we did. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, yes, no you did. water. People at home. Okay. Just yogurt, guys. Yeah. I mean, it's a maverick move. Maverick isn't move. It? Yeah. So I think we've probably got time for one or two more questions from the audience, or if there's anything mm. else from the people at home. Anyone else? Good evening. You must have quite a lot of questions. Have I got a question? So I suppose my big question. It's a small question. So there are hundreds of tips in the book, uh, hundreds, thousands, if not more. Um, around, uh, you know, sort of all things that you can, do, you can do in terms of eating more sustainably, eating for the planet. Um, but today, I suppose we're talking about eating for, um, food for the soul and cooking for the soul. If you had one or two bits of advice from the book, or just from you, Anna Jones, yeah. around, you know, how to, how to eat or cook for the soul, what would they be? I think it would be just, like, that thing of, like, individuality. I think, you know, only we know the food that kind of, like, gets us excited and kind of lights us up and I think you know I think making those foods and making you know not necessarily you know if you love uh, Big Mac meals for instance I'm not encouraging you to eat those um, three meals a day but if there's a way of like if there's something that you love maybe trying to like find a recipe for a way that you can make that in a sort of more healthy or um, more vibrant way and you can kind of work that into your week I feel like it's it's uh, you know I think so much focus can be put on kind of wellness and whilst I absolutely wholeheartedly as I'm sure all of you will know by the end of this hour of talking about vegetables um stand behind you know the fact that you know eating nutrient dense like vibrant delicious uh, local seasonal food is amazing I absolutely also believe that you know there can be more nutrition in a pizza and a beer with your best friends than there can be in a, you know, hurriedly sort of um, drunk green smoothie as you run out the door. So I think it's always about kind of remembering that and remembering that balance and remembering that food is, it is what you put on the plate, but also it's so much about the, you know, the environment that you cook it in, the way that you eat it, the people, um, that you share it with and, and 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 I think you know there is so much discussion around food and wellness and you know labeling food good and bad and ways of eating good and bad that I just feel like it's really important to kind of just shout from the rooftops about the kind of absolute unbridled joy of food and you know yeah yeah amazing and on that note thank you very much ah, thanks guys it was really fun delicious and thanks to Gadeet for, you know, 
so eloquently Hopefully interviewing. Yeah. Um, but thank Gorgeous. you all for coming. It was a lovely evening and lovely to see you all. Thanks. And thank you. <coughs> thank you, Omar, for, for all of you being here. Um, we've raised so much money for Young Minds, so I'm really appreciative to those who have donated. Um, so thank you. And thank you to Anna and Gurdjieff for being here this evening. Um, we've also got some <coughs> fresh produce here from Square Mile Farm. So if anyone would like some, there's some lettuce, there's some basil, there's a variety of fresh herbs here. Um, if anyone would like to take some home, then just come on over and we'll give you some. So yeah, thank you all for coming. Hi. Thanks, guys.